And here we go. All right. Okay, so... Hello, and uh, welcome to this Pop Gnosis episode of Talk Gnosis. Today we're going to be talking about the Netflix phenomenon Sandman, created by Neil Gaiman. I'm Jason Memmel, and I'm joined with my co-host, B. Skolnick. Say hi, B. Hello. Um, and so if you're new to Gnosticism, the absolute shortest way I can describe it is kind of a deeper knowing that you can't learn or be taught, but you can discover through faith, mystical exploration, or my favorite, art. It can be described as you remembering something you didn't know you forgot. And uh, a lot of older, older traditions have a whole cosmology of figures that are either trying to keep us from remembering or at the very least get in the way of remembering. On Pop Gnosis, we take a look at culture around us through a Gnostic lens. Sometimes the connections are direct and easy to see, and sometimes they may be lurking just underneath and need to be uncovered and with a little bit of digging. And so that's what we're doing here. Um, and so, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, Sandman, which is a, a Netflix TV show based on a, a Neil Gaiman comic that he's done with a lot of other artists. And, um, and I'm going to go do a quick uh, synopsis and then uh, then we'll dive in. Um, so Sandman, if you're not already aware, uh, is or and also Hecate, even, if you, even if you are, just to kind of set the stage, uh, is about a figure named Dream. Dream is in charge of everything involved with the act of dreaming, and he's a kingdom of the world of dreams, and he has siblings who are in charge of other elements of the world, like death. They're all D-themed. Uh, a magician traps Dream in about 1910, 1920, which curses the world to decades of bad sleep. Dream escapes. He has to quest to find the fragments of his power, involving all kinds of horrible nightmares wreaking havoc in the world. He also has to figure out what to do with Rose, a woman who is a dream vortex and who could bring all of the dreaming down and maybe in the world. Alongside all of the all of these uh, bigger stories, we get interludes and side stories. Uh, we, we discover the dream has been meeting the same person at a bar for uh, 600 years, a uh, person who's decided not to die. That's it. He's just decided not to die. Uh, we discover Dream of a Thousand Cats, in which humans once lived in a world controlled by cats, and which the humans changed by dreaming of a different world. We discovered that Dream was once married to Calliope, a Greek muse of inspiration who's been mishandled by mortals. So yeah, so the show covers a lot of territory. Um, uh, we just uh, uh, binged it, I think, uh, both uh, Rebecca or B and I, over the last uh, uh, few months here. And uh, yeah, so we're excited to, to talk about it, to talk about what we enjoyed, but also talk about the Gnostic connections and the, that sense of um, perhaps remembering something we didn't know we forgot. Um, uh, how was that synopsis? Is, is there anything you yeah, wanted to Yeah, bravo. No, you did great. <laughs> I, I loved it. Um, and you, you even touched on my favorite episode, which was the, the meeting um, in the bar, I think was, was probably my favorite episode of the series. So mm, maybe mm, not cool. immediately, but we'll get back to it at some point. I'd love to talk more about that. But yeah, that's, you hit all the bullet points. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> and like, I should say is that if you haven't seen the show and you're interested in what we're talking about, uh, none of what I said can spoil it because despite you knowing some of these bits are going to happen, the, 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 the craftsmanship of the show and the quality of the performances, the quality of the, of the show, I find so high that uh, that that watching it is enjoyable, even if you know what's happening. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think the stories are old too. Like it, it really fits kind of in this world of popnosis that we're looking at because I think so many of the characters and the stories, and it is very cyclical in nature as a show. Mm -hmm. Uh, itself and like as a world, um, it's all things that we are familiar with on some level. So I really do love this framing of it, of Gnosis being a remembering of something that you have forgotten or that kind of feeling. Yeah, it just evokes a feeling in me. And I think the show kind of encompasses that feeling as well, because mm -hmm. there is this um, inception that Christopher Christopher Nolan movie, like there's this inception <laughs> tinge to it that's like what's real and what what's happening in the waking world what's happening in the dreaming world mm -hmm. and the like liminal space between the two yeah well and like uh it's so like i guess it would live in this world of sort of i would call it uh, like sort of modern fantasy um but it's also got this kind of more like fairy tale aspect to it mm -hmm. um where like uh there are things that the show doesn't stop to explain like in the sense that like another other kinds of fantasy and sci-fi would be like okay if this is going to happen we need to tell the audience how it works you know 
But uh, like, so for example, there's a woman in the show who um, uh, gets pregnant in her dream and then wakes up pregnant. And there, like, you're not, no one has given any information as to how that happened, like <laughs> how that works. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Other um, than like the, the smallest bit of like nugget of information is like, oh, it has to do with this dream vortex. And then, yes, you're left to be like, okay, I will fill in my own blanks on that one, on the biology yeah. of that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Like, and it's, a, um, it's, there's something interesting there about, I don't know, maybe there's something there about like mythology and art and poetry, like a, a lot of this, um, living in a space in which you don't explain it, you just tell it, if that makes sense. Like you just kind of, um, this is what's important to the story or this is what's resonant or what have you. And so so it's not gonna be, um, like you're not gonna get the, uh, the like the, um, what am I trying to say here? Like, like a detective like explanation of it. You're not gonna get it dissected for you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, this might be a great place to dive in because I know you're familiar with the source material, the comics, mm. in a way that I am not. And so that's very much um, a visual medium, but also written written word, you know, very storybooky or can be mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about. Um, but I also think that in film there or television there is this notion of show don't tell like mm -hmm. use mm -hmm. use the visual format to reveal things that so you're not giving your characters like extraneous dialogue if you could show something mm -hmm. visually so i think that is a really interesting way of looking at the series as a whole is like how do they lean on the visual world um, and then i guess my question to you would yeah. be how does that compare to the comics and yeah yeah well I, yeah so that's like it's i mean comics and, and adaptation of that kind of had a really interesting history there have been some some works that have used comics only as a springboard and they so they essentially disregard the comics as anything other than the vague concept you know maybe or maybe the franchise if it's popular um uh and then you've now got like things like the marvel movies which are inspired by the comics but not often referencing a single specific book you know so it's more of like a, a general like gestalt of of these characters that are kind of like uh clearly you know with, with borrowings from from different specific books um and then you've got other other works where uh like Zack snyder was famous for for both watchmen and 300 for essentially trying to duplicate the panel like the same yeah. angle the same physical posture you know the same colors like i really trying to get it down um and so in all of those i think what's interesting is that the fan uh, is sitting there looking at it going what am i like how is what i'm seeing relate to what i saw before and um and in like so zach snyder's case it's like it's attempts to duplicate and in some of those other cases it's it's a it's a separate thing you know it's clearly going in a different direction Sandman lives in this strange world where, I mean, that, that just fits as a, as a sentence, but it lives in a strange world in which the fan is both rewarded and surprised in the show, mm. um, which I was really impressed by, like, that I was never um, bored because I knew exactly what was going to happen, but I felt rewarded because I had this extra level of engagement and knowledge about how they were going to, to, to do something, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, so I was like, yeah, I was very, very impressed uh, in terms of their the way they adapted it as a as an experience of both accessible to somebody who has never read the comics and accessible and engaging for a fan. I think that's which, which is fascinating. Um, uh, which also this is the the, the the Gnostic element there might maybe as well is that like you know a lot of ancient Gnosticism or our, our approach to ancient Gnosticism comes through text, and I think there is something interesting here as well about um about something that has a mythological context that had a previous text that is still working within it an attempt to inspire and engage people who are familiar with both if that makes sense yeah definitely like i had a i had a feeling of like i was saying there before about that remembering something you didn't know you forgot i had that feeling while watching the show of like remembering an element in the comic that i didn't know i'd forgotten or seeing an element that that um connects to but does not duplicate 
Mm, if that makes sense. You yeah, know, totally. Like, so, so it, it created these sort of aha moments, you know, um, uh, around like sort of uh, so some of the, like, the mythological connections and the the uh, um, uh, sort of uh, more like psychological elements of like what's happening in Dream's head and that kind of thing. Um, so, so yeah, it's uh, like, and there, there are things like with that, the, the baby that was born in, in the dream, there's kind of a thing that I'm sitting there going like, how are they going to manage this as it relates to what I know happens in the comic much later on, you know? Oh, interesting. Um, okay. You know, um, and it's interesting how they've both, uh, maybe it's because, the, because it's TV and you don't know how many episodes you're going to get kind of thing. <laughs> um, but like on one hand, I think like, oh, they're kind of underplaying something that was bigger in the comic, but they're also not ignoring it. You know, they're not, they're not leaving that thread. Uh, they're not snipping the thread, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I actually thought the show really was interesting in the threads that they decided to tease and then the ones mm. that they did leave for you. Like, I actually felt like there were quite a few breadcrumbs left throughout <laughs> the show of either unexplained things or characters or i guess this is going back to like the they didn't feel the need to explain themselves mm -hmm. throughout like certain character names are the same and so you're like oh i'm supposed to know that this was you in a former version maybe <laughs> you know mm -hmm. but like it doesn't really explain it and so i do feel that they've left themselves in a good place to make season two because mm -hmm. like you said, they can keep teasing those, um, but I don't feel like they wasted time in the first season with anything that like couldn't be wrapped up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like they, none of the breadcrumbs they left felt um, like, uh, like the wrong crumb, <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. um, or like, like not a, not a breadcrumb, but a whole entire slice that they're just like, um, no, <laughs> you know, we're going to not use this. Um, everything, everything felt like if we only got this season, it would have felt cohesive. It would have felt whole. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Agreed. Um, uh, so, so yeah. Um, and then the other thing, like, so, uh, just talking about the, the, uh, again, that whole, it's mythological element and this notion of like, not explaining things. There's a sense in which, too, I think this is kind of a, um, uh, like, I think I find resonant in, in a lot of myth and a lot of, like, fairy tale epics, those kinds of things, is specifically the notion of mystery. Like, that uh, in some cases, it's, it's a matter of, like, not explaining something. But I think in other cases, it is a matter of, like, um, the mystery is the point. Like, we're not going to explain this for you, or something's going to happen that is dramatic but not set up if that makes sense mm, like yeah uh, sometimes a, a story will feel overly um or like how do i put it like you can see like you can see very clearly say in a marvel movie oh this is when the hero discovers that they're better than the villain or you know like some kind of like really clear hero moment that is connected to an earlier moment that's all very cleanly cleanly set up but also very like because it's so tightly wound, there's no questions as you walk out, you know? Whereas um, uh, some of these myths uh, that like that he's drawing on and uh, and just the tradition of like horror fiction and fantasy fiction can often live in this space in which like, we don't know what this is, you know? Mm, like, yeah. And and you, are, you aren't gonna find out and, and sitting with that is kind of the point. I don't know if I'm making sense, but it's cool. like- Yeah, um, of course. Uh, like, I, I guess, you know, again, kind of coming back to that notion of, for, for Gnosticism, like, I think there is, like, one of the things I think a lot about in Gnosticism is the ineffable, like, that we, we're, we're talking about a connection to something we can't describe, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I know. Um, so, so I think there being things in, in, uh, in the, the fiction that we consume that are, that leaves space for the indescribable, maybe that's what I'm kind of getting at, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, like the three witches, or not three witches, but the three fates. Oh, the fates. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> loved that interpretation of them so much. Yes. Yeah, so there are these three, three fates, uh, and they appear multiple times in the series, both to dream as uh, helpers, and then mm -hmm. also to Rose, the human who is the dream vortex. Uh, later on in the series, and they appear in the form of the same woman, but in 
um, maiden mother crone versions mm -hmm. of of her which I also think is so, was just so visually stunning. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are very much speaking in questions and not so much in riddles, but they are, they have rules of how they are going to deliver information. And yes, I just loved the, that interpretation of, of them. And also yeah. kind of a little Hecate in there as well, kind of, which is Mother Maiden Crone. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I just, I, I loved, I loved the interpretation of the fates. Um, and there, they, there's also, they do show up in Cali uh, the Calliope uh, story as well, the Muse one. Cool. Um, uh, I won't say much more than that, but I will say maybe, I think in that episode and maybe even in the Rose one, um, it is, it's a maiden mother crone, but they're not actually all the same woman because they're actually sometimes different ethnicities. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. In, in at least one of them, I think. I think I'm, I'm not 100, percent but I think what I think like so again, this kind of gets back to a um, an element that I like, in which there is a there's a theme, but not a rule uh, on in how the, some of this stuff is presented. Like the the three women will appear, but they won't always look exactly the same way. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and again, there's that notion of like not not getting not not letting you get comfortable. Oh, this is Here's the, the the trio. I know what this is. I know exactly what this is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, sorry, I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Um, go! <laughs> <laughs> but, so the, the, the Maiden Mother Crone, I got really interested in this, and I did some Googling, and, like, I guess the the, the, the popular image we have of it, and the, the image that they use in, in Sandman, is kind of mostly traces itself back to Robert Graves, um, who uh, had a I think it's either the White Goddess or the Greek Myths series that he that he, he wrote, um, and that like sc current scholarship is kind of not sure that he got it right. Like uh, mm. in fact, like they're kind of they're they're fairly critical that that it's um it's more of like a poetic invention more so than a historical fact in some of these cases. Specifically and, to the fates or in this larger mythos of Maiden Mother Crone? The the larger mythos, like the okay. Maiden Mother Crone, you know, sort of feeling of it. But um, I've also been like watching a lot of Joseph Campbell videos and like reading reading uh, works by him. And there's, there's kind of a sense in which I'm like, whether or not there is a historical precedent for what for the for the the archetype it doesn't mean the archetype doesn't doesn't exist and didn't exist if that makes mm, sense sure um like well and like as you mentioned like uh, hecate has a a trio aspect to her and yeah. there are the three fates and like so you know maybe maybe uh graves might have been stating things as history that are more like um aesthetics if that makes sense <laughs> sure. um you know uh, and that scholarship is maybe disagreeing with him on that point, but I still agree with the with the the archetype he's tapping into, um, if that makes sense. And like, I guess what I, where I'm kind of going with this again is that like, I think I think something like Sandman doesn't. I mean, because it's fiction, it almost doesn't even have to worry even as much as Graves does. <laughs> like, sure. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, well, it's th just using something that's kind of in the collective conscience to say, exactly. okay, we all understand this. Um, yeah, I, I would add for the Maiden Mother Crone, I'm not actually familiar with Graves or his work, mm -hmm. but right off the bat, I was like, oh, interesting. I would like um, a female or a non-binary, like a genderless um, perspective kind of on this very mm -hmm. gendered topic of <laughs> Maiden Mother Crone. But totally. it, it, it really is kind of just these within a life cycle. It's saying youth kind of like youth power wisdom was Pythagoras's breaking up mm -hmm. of the of a life. And so that's kind of what Maiden Mother Crone does as well, is saying these are different roles that we will play in our mm -hmm. lives and different ages and different um it does evoke a feeling. Like we're actually having this conversation on Yule on the winter solstice, which is yeah. Which is Hecate's up. day. Yeah, <laughs> because it's very much about like past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. And and three does seem to be, and it's a three day. If you do the numerology on, on today, it's a three. Yeah. So it's all very aligned. Like it does have this energy of these, these three different kind of chapters of human life or experience. So we have our, when we're young, 
um, or the maiden we have when we are in our power when and that has to do with creativity as a whole not just um, mother as like pregnant or childbearing but mm -hmm. in your creative power what are what are you bringing forth and then in the crone you know how when we age like how are we turning that into wisdom how are we allowing especially here like at the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere um, how are we interacting with death, dying, or like the idea of being fallow? So mm -hmm. I do think there's a lot of potent symbolism within all of those things. And like you're saying, there might not be uh, scholarly historical, you know, information to support some of these things, but they definitely exist through myth, through story, and exactly. through like repeated symbolism. That's one of my mm -hmm. favorite things about the soup of kind of occult or or esotericism or um, totally. philosophy or religion is that you can see all of these threads like throughout culture and story so on some level they must be true like we must they must make sense to us or be yeah. useful exactly no i think that's exactly well and i think useful uh useful versus true is the <laughs> thing that i think a lot about <laughs> um sure that's uh, fair <laughs> you know like because there's uh like religion is often myth that is trying also to be history i find like mm -hmm. i mean that is very yeah. reductive and i mean there's i don't want to uh i'm not i'm not a religious scholar but uh that's okay here on popnosis we are reductive <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly we're this is the wild west here um uh but uh um but that the reason i mentioned that is because like I, I often see say on like gnostic subreddits or like online groups and things like that is are people kind of saying like you know, what is the, like, what does Gnosticism think about this, you know, text or this religion or this, like, um, you know, theological point or what have you, as though um, we're talking about things that are, are like, um, almost like laws, you know, like these documents that have been written in this very, like, sort of specific way, this is how this works. And, um, and that if you, if you can't find that history, if you can't find that document, then it doesn't, it's not valid somehow, mm. you know, and that's, whereas, so like, that's why I've been kind of saying, like, it doesn't have to be true in the sense that ancient Gnostics wrote a text that proves point A for point A to be still useful for you. I love this conversation so much. I really do. <laughs> I think it's so juicy because also it just takes into account like history versus progress as well, which again, mm -hmm. we're kind of looking in past, present, future. Like, what did they say? What's useful to us now? But like, how is it going to help us get to where we want to go? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I love, I totally understand the desire for historical accuracy and context. And I think it's mm -hmm. absolutely, I'm definitely not platforming myself to say like, chuck out history or anything. No, <laughs> like, no. We need it. Um, yeah. But I think that what you're talking about is so interesting because there used to be no separation between the practical and the mystical, even mm -hmm. kind of in some of these ancient universities or early religious mm -hmm. scholars and, and the people who are writing the texts that we want to talk about so badly. Um, we're not necessarily looking at a worldview in which they separated kind of miracle or ineff that which is ineffable from mm -hmm. that which they could explain or codify or or whatever. And now we have in our modern culture, I think we have separated those a lot. And so mm -hmm. we want to return to magical, and I include religion in magical. Um, we want to return to magical spaces that require magical thinking with a logic and like with rationale that absolutely has a place but like does not kind of trample the magical. Um, no, so or we the have, political. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so that is what we're talking about here, especially with a story like Sandman, which mm -hmm. does evoke such a feeling space and a, a, an imaginative space. And I, I do want to talk about change as it exists in the series. Yeah, yeah. Because I think okay, that's go. kind of what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I'll get off my um, imaginative soapbox, but uh, okay. So I think change in the world of Sandman is super fascinating to me. And I think it comes down to who is the storyteller and the fact that 
Um, and this might be a spicy hot cake, but like if God is a construct, right? Or if gods in this mm -hmm. in this key, like if gods are characters that were created by humans, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we all then we inherently like to anthropomorphize our gods in our storytelling because they take on human characteristics, they take on human form. You know, in Sandman, mm -hmm. we do have some more fantasy forms, but for the most part, they're played by human actors looking like mm -hmm. humans. Um, and especially in Sandman, I have been thinking about how, so the siblings are all called the Endless. So mm -hmm. his, and they're, you, I think you had mentioned this, that they are somehow in the hierarchy higher than gods. Like they yeah. hold more power. They're kind of just these constructs. Um, mm -hmm but that they are in service. They do act in service to humanity, but in some ways they are also kind of envious of the human experience mm -hmm. or wanting to understand the human experience, which I just think as a now getting really <laughs> meta with it, it's like human beings writing about gods wanting to be human beings mm -hmm. and really kind of not romanticizing the human experience, but there is an element of like, fascination and curiosity with being human. Mm -hmm. um, but then, so in this story, we see death. Uh, oh, we see death. I, I definitely want to talk about her, but desire. Yeah. We haven't spoken about the sibling desire oh, yeah. mm -hmm. who shows up. Um, and this is also kind of what I love about Sandman is it's always weaving itself in on it, like in on itself. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, so desire doesn't show up in the physical form until like the last couple of episodes, but we learn that they've definitely had a hand in the, like in what we've seen throughout mm -hmm. the show. They've had a hand in that, even if they haven't been introduced to us. And so we find out that a lot of this kind of above the fray is really desire wanting to mess with dream. And so mm -hmm. the human beings, even though they are supposedly acting in service to humans, are also kind of fodder for their gameplay, like on this higher level. Yeah. 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 So, um, and then I guess my, my final thought about change is that then we also see, because I was kind of thinking, you know, Gnosticism doesn't have to be a heroic journey. And I don't think that's the only or the mm. most potent way of storytelling necessarily but i was thinking like who is the hero in this story and you could definitely say that dream is a hero in the story um mm. not meaning he does good things just meaning like he is the central figure yeah. who goes on a journey and actually does have to change in the course of that which I also think is fascinating because if he's a god, then how are we putting, like, wouldn't you think like gods wouldn't have to change? <laughs> gods would be these like idealized perfect forms. So mm -hmm. I just think the messiness of humans writing gods being humans is like very fascinating to me. Totally, yeah. Well, so like, um, I think there's a sense where, uh, so th this was something I put in our notes about this idea, like, so, um, again, in case anybody's watching this who's more familiar with Sandman than the Gnosticism, there's a whole concept in a lot of classical Gnosticism of archons, these these figures that are, you know, possibly like angels or like, you know, demigods or what have you, that are kind of part of the system that is keeping you from connecting to Gnosis, connecting to that to that uh, source or that that, um, uh, that that kind of remembering. And um, in some versions, there it's very overt. Like their job is to keep you down. You know, <laughs> um, uh, uh, same thing with the demiurge, their boss. Like their job is to like enforce the rules of the world. And some one of those rules is you don't get out. Like you don't, you don't get to to connect to anything bigger. Um, uh, and so, whereas in this case, I think what you're saying there about them being like both being like more powerful than gods, being um uh these like you know hu like hugely cosmic figures that are also somehow in service to humanity that are like doing it because of us 
uh, and that's even a line from the show um, uh, that that uh, I think death is like death says like you know we're here for them. Um, uh, she also has a great line. Um, uh, death is a uh, uh, a young woman kind of in like sort of goth clothes um, who's kind of like perky and and fun but also wise. And uh, she says at one point like um, I was there when the first living thing. Uh, opened its eyes, and I will be there at the end to turn out the lights and and uh, put up the chairs. Um, the death episode. If you have to watch one episode <laughs> of Sandman, I knew we were going to get back to it because it's my favorite. <laughs> is the death episode? It's so it's such a like sweet and and interesting take on death. And the idea is that Dream, it's his sister, so Dream mm -hmm. like reunites with death and follows her around for a morning as she is with people at, at while she transitions people essentially, like takes mm -hmm. them, takes them out of the living and, and back. And so mm -hmm. he's just going about her day with her, but they are having these very interesting conversations. And then that leads right into the person that he has been meeting every hundred years for however yeah. long, because he and we flash way back to like 14 something. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, and he and Death are in a tavern together and they overhear someone, um, this man basically saying, why, why does everyone have to die? I just won't do it. Mm -hmm. And so Death hears him and they have this, Dream and Death have this cheeky little moment together where they say, okay, we'll, we'll grant that for him. And so Dream, mm -hmm. Dream, who also that's this man's dream to never die. So it is this mm -hmm. cool interplay. <laughs> so Dream yeah. walks over and he's like, I'll grant you your, your dream based on my sister Death, who's also okayed this plan. And so you can live forever, um, but you have to meet with me every hundred years and tell me essentially why you still want to be alive. Like, let's see mm -hmm. if your answer has changed the longer that you're in the world. Mm. And so then they start meeting every hundred years and some, some hundred years have been kinder to this man than others. Mm -hmm. And um, they finally meet, this is, I mean, spoiler alert, I'm just going to say mm -hmm. it because this was, this is what I think you were talking about earlier with these really well-crafted um, moments within mm -hmm. it that that you're like, oh yeah, I forgot we were even talking about this. And now, yeah. now I remember. So they get into a fight. <laughs> they get into a fight <laughs> one time when they meet each other because the man says, I think you're lonely. I think you're really fascinated with human beings. I think you kind of want to be one. And I think mm -hmm. that you keep meeting me every hundred years because we're friends. And Dream has this wild reaction and it's like, we are not friends. I am not who mm -hmm. you think I am. And um, I will leave, like we'll never see each other again. And so the man says, in a hundred years, when we meet again, if you show up, it will be because we are friends. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> which I also yeah. felt to be like quite wholesome in the middle <laughs> of the story. Um, and so the next time they're supposed to meet, Dream doesn't show up. Um, he stands he stands the man up. And then they flash to Dream in the magician's, in the where he was being held by the magician. Mm -hmm. And you realize, oh my gosh, it's not because they were not, not friends. It's because, of course, he was imprisoned for mm -hmm. that specific amount of time. And I had totally at that point, I did not expect them to connect that story back to the larger. Yeah, I don't know. For the, me, I was like, oh my gosh, that's right. Like that's when he was <laughs> in prison. So maybe everyone watching it is smarter than me, but that was yeah. just a moment of like, oh, right. Um, and then a mm -hmm. hundred years later, they do meet again in the present. And they are yeah. friends. <laughs> and well, and, and I think uh, um, Robert says, like, says something essentially indicates that, you know, you've changed. Mm -hmm. And and your point about change is, I think, really interesting, too, uh, because there's a um, uh, uh, there's a quality in which, like, Dream presents himself as, like, I am the endless, I am Dream, I've always been Dream, these are the rules, this is how the world works, like, this is it. And 
but that the process of having been uh, going through, been trapped for like 80 years by this magician. Um, and he's just basically in a glass bottle for, you know, like this like big gigantic bottle for 80 years, just sit and he's silent uh, for that long, um, that it does change him. And I think there's something like kind of going back to, again, this notion of like archons that are like, you know, um, in charge of the world. Um, I think there's something really interesting about this idea of the archons uh, if, if we're saying that the Endless are slightly archonic in the sense that they have a job, um, but that they can change, you know? They have um, a profession. Can, That's what they have makes a them archonic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, because, you know, like a, a lot of times when we think of like, especially like Greek gods or something like that, they're more like um, like forces of nature with a face, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this does feel more like like a person who has a job that just happens to be bigger than the universe. Like, <laughs> yes. you know. Yeah. Um, well, and that he doesn't expect his realm to change either. Like when he mm -hmm. comes back. So there's this return after he escapes capture and he returns back to his realm, like the land of, of dreams. Mm -hmm. And he's very surprised to see that it, it has changed in his absence. And then one of his creations, so I guess like the main villain of season one would be the Corinthian, who mm -hmm. is this figure who wears glasses to hide the fact that he doesn't have eyes. Mm -hmm. And what does he have instead of eyes? What Do does he remember? have instead of eyes? Did I miss it? He has teeth in his eyes. Oh, yes, of course. Because the <laughs> skull, the skull at the very end. Yeah. I looked and I was like, I need that skull. Like, I don't know why, <laughs> but I just like, want to have that skull. <laughs> that skull. Yes, he has teeth instead of eyes. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is so gross and weird in the yeah. in the CGI of it all. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and he goes around taking out other people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And so there is this very interesting real world um, kind of, Again, he's living in, he belongs in the dreamland, but he's mm -hmm. living in the waking land because dream has been captured. So nobody has, has been playing that, nobody's been doing his job. And so mm -hmm. kind of when he comes back, he's surprised to see that all of his creations are kind of running amok uh, as well. You know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of edging my way into my own hot take here. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> There's, so uh, one of the things about the Corinthian as well is like in this period the dream is trapped um, it's it's suggested that the Corinthian has um, not through like magic powers in terms of making people do it but through literally by like setting an example by being this like murderous person li moving out in, in the human world he's essentially inspired a community of serial killers yes and there's a there's a moment where um, uh, where I think I think it's when the, when the Corinthian is defeated by by the Sandman that the Sandman says to everybody um, because he says to everybody you have thought that you were um, you know that you were heroes that you were hunters that you were important and I am telling you now just how small you all really are and like how how little your your personal narratives truly mean like it's he's kind of mean about it but i mean he's talking to a room full of serial killers so like they deserve it but what i where i'm kind of backing my my where i'm backing into my hot take here is that there's like i think it's it's fair to say um that we're living in a world right now where there have been a lot of people who um have been hijacked by narratives that make them feel like they're more powerful you know mm -hmm. um and there was something really resonant about watching a guy with magic powers just like rip the bad narratives out of them, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. It's like, that's, a, that's kind of a fantasy that, you know, you, you wish could happen. Um, and I think it also happens in, in a lot of, a lot of uh, expressions of Gnosticism. Don't focus on Gnosis, on connecting to a divine source, on, ex on exploring what that divine source is. They're really just documenting the archons and the demiurge, and like mm. they want it to be as much about 
uh, they want to revel in the bad stuff because it makes them feel less. It ex explains the bad, but it doesn't. It, the, the, that's all it does. Like it's just it's just focusing on the prison bars, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, and well, and it's touching a very real place, which is that at the end of the day, why do we turn to story? And everything mm -hmm. is story. And why do we turn to stories that specifically talk about the construct of the universe, like how it, the cosmo cosmogony, the cosmology, mm -hmm. like how it came to be, how it will end? Like, why are we drawn to that? Because we want to explain the ineffable and we want to answer unanswerable questions because mm -hmm. sometimes it is scarier to sit in the unknown uh, yes. and yeah. with our own mortality and our own ignorance and to sit in all that we don't know. And so anything that makes us feel safer or more certain or whatever, or more powerful, or more yeah. powerful right, more in control is attractive. Like that's attractive to us. Mm -hmm. And so also in Sandman, is this notion that dream has been captured. So he's not without his own limitations because mm -hmm. then first of all, he's captured by a human and there is some level of like, that's embarrassing. Like he can't <laughs> yeah. go, you know what I mean? Like he, he can't go back and like tell people that yeah. he was captured by a magician for X amount of years because somewhere in the, in like that upper echelon of the endless, like that's embarrassing that he got caught essentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then his quest at first, there, there are actually, it's quite nonlinear. <laughs> the mm -hmm. the yeah. first season is quite nonlinear and there are like sections to the storytelling. Like the story mm -hmm. that we get in the first few episodes kind of wraps and then we get this new story and then that kind mm -hmm. of wraps. So. There are definitely chapters to it, but the first chapter upon his escape is him reclaiming these three tools, his sand, his ruby, and uh, his, mask. his mask. Yes. Yeah. And so he has to go to different realms and try and discover like where these tools are, but essentially without them, he also isn't as powerful. So mm -hmm. we really are watching a story of a God who has a lot of mortal properties <laughs> to him, like a lot yeah. of mortal characteristics. Um, well, and I think he even says at one point, like, um, as he's like, I think when he gets the final piece, he goes like, I think you've taught me that I put too much of myself in tools. Yes. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Which um, is also very much like we're putting too much of our, uh, we're putting too much into texts or into, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Systems. I'll just speak like as yeah. a witch, you know, as a witch, like I use tarot or I use numerology, but I'm very clear that those are tools that I'm using to access different information or different parts of myself or mm -hmm. to connect with different energies. But my magic is not in a tarot deck. It's in me and I use a tarot deck. So even without it, I sh should be able mm -hmm. to, to make those connections. Um and I think actually Gnosis is direct experience. So it would mm -hmm. be without tools. Well, that, that, that's the thing. Then. Like, you know, it, or the, the tools could like create a space in which, um, like at their best, tools yeah. can create a space in which you then let Gnosis through, you know? Um, but then the flip side of that is is only seeing the tool, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, only focusing on on if you're following the rules of your tools, if that makes sense. Like, um, yeah. uh, like I only do tarot readings that are Kabbalistic crosses and I only <laughs> right. do them at like, you know, this time or this way or what have you, um, uh, versus like, what is, what is creating space for a feeling that's bigger than the tool, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that, yeah, like, and then dream sort of figures out, like, maybe I'm putting too much in this, this, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, and it's only when the Ruby breaks. Mm -hmm. And then he becomes like literally huge, like enormous. Yeah. And um, which that whole, there are some stunning visual sequences in the totally. show for sure that are really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, but he becomes enormous. And then uh, 
it kind of leaves those tools behind is it, that's he's mm -hmm. much more able to the sand makes another appearance of course but yeah. like he's able to move forward kind of without the mask and without which i also think is symbolically interesting that he mm -hmm. doesn't ever wear it again um yeah. and that it's when the ruby breaks and the tool breaks that he actually kind of assumes the height of his power and he says he has a line about um being like the most powerful that he like kind of returned to that raw power and mm -hmm. not what exactly to do with it feeling kind of unsure about that mm -hmm. um, and almost like he forgot what it was like to be at his full power until the tools were literally destroyed mm -hmm. and kind of forced into that return i don't know there's something yeah. Well, yeah, like there's a, there's a, I mean, a lot of like, I think, uh, what would it be like, say, ascetic uh, mystical practices are involved stripping things away, you know, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even like missing it creates a space to think about why you're missing it and to create, you know what I mean? Like creates a, a space in which you can think other things or think wider. I mean, even just meditation has kind of a, an, el an element of that, like trying to, I was just talking about this today, like sometimes I'm meditating and I'll have a thought about like, my job or, or my family or something and they'll be like oh i should remember that maybe i should write it down no the point right now is to actually try letting go <laughs> you know uh, yeah, uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah when i lead clients through a meditation like at the beginning of readings or or something mm -hmm. there's always a point where you know we touch in with the intentions that we're bringing to a space or the questions that um that they might be bringing and I, I guide them to let those thoughts bubble up. And I, I just offer, um, maybe you catch them as they go by, but maybe you don't. Mm -hmm. You actually mm -hmm. just let them up and out and you trust that when you need to reclaim them, that they'll be there somewhere in your ether. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that is, again, easier said than done because we like to attached to our thoughts <laughs> totally yeah, yeah. We're, well then we're we're used to attaching to thoughts like in a way uh meditating is like um i remember at one point i was meditating and then like my neighbors were being loud or something and i was like at first i was like oh don't you know i'm, I'm trying to do something spiritual here they should be quiet but then i'm like no me stepping out of the world for a minute i'm the one doing the weird thing you know <laughs> like and and me letting go of my frustration at their disturbance of my of my peace is a thing to let go of <laughs> you know what i mean like it's yeah, um, yeah and uh, that you have to be again providing that setting or those conditions to have a spiritual experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of allowing it to be completely integrated that no matter where you are or what's happening you are still able to pull mm -hmm inwards and have that experience kind of regardless of what else is going on totally um uh i wanted to go back to your point about desire and dream and their like sibling fighting and the nature of it being like uh the the the, the capacity for them to be human even though they're bigger than gods like i want to connect yeah. back to that but i do also want to just uh, do a quick patreon shout out yes. <laughs> um so uh uh before we get to the to, to some extra good stuff here I'll just mention that uh, the sh doing a show like this, we can't really do it without your support. Um, we've got like server costs and and the time costs involved in, in building a lot of this stuff and, and getting the shows ready. And so if you feel like you're interested in contributing, you can contribute as, as little or as much as you like at patreon.com slash Gnostic. I'll put it up on the screen here. Um, and uh, that's one way you can contribute. That's uh, I think we can you can set it to however much you want and you can set it for every time we do a thing or you can set a max. So like whatever that whatever uh, suits your needs that we're, we're good with there um we've also got paypal.me slash gnostic if you want to just do a one-time donation or a, like a specific lump sum um also uh, you can reach most of us on on social media or the internet pretty easily if you just want to reach out and another way you can help us is literally by just sharing the show uh telling other people about it um if you've got uh, if we've said something that you've got a question about that you want one of your friends to answer send it to them and like start a conversation and then you know, uh, get back to us, put it in the chat or put it in the um, uh, like Reddit or Facebook or wherever it is you might be finding this show. Um, so yeah, with that, uh, that said, so the thing about 
Desire and Dream. So Desire is a fascinating character. Uh, they're depicted as, I would say, non-binary would be the uh, the best way to describe it. I, I would definitely say that, but they are specifically gendered at one point in the show in a okay. fascinating way that, can I spoil it? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay, well, so they, um, so Rose, the dream vortex, we mm -hmm. find out way in the beginning of the show that when dream is captured, some people fall into a coma like sleep for years and years and years. And so we see this young woman fall asleep and is unable to wake up. And then later in the show, we realize that Rose, this dream vortex, is the granddaughter of the woman who we have seen sleep essentially mm -hmm. for however long. And she woke up the day that dream had escaped. And so there's two dream, there's two sleeping pregnancies, one in the present, but then mm -hmm. also this woman reveals that she uh, dreamt that she had a child, but when she woke up, she realized that that had actually happened. And then it's revealed that desire was the father of that baby that ultimately mm -hmm. led to Rose, mm -hmm. like in lineage. Yeah, so yeah. desire is definitely androgynous, uh, definitely, I think, would fall under the non binary, like somewhere in the non binary space. Mm -hmm. But they are said to be the father of this mm. child, which I thought was really fascinating. Well, and I think it's it's probably fair to say that if Desire wanted to be a mother, that they could do that too. <laughs> sure, totally, <laughs> <You know? laughs> totally, like yeah. The, the way that character is represented, it's like you kind of feel like uh, all of that is within their power. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they've got a sibling rivalry thing going. We don't really kind of know what started it exactly. Um, uh, I can't remember if it's covered in the comics. Maybe somebody in the in online will will remind me. But um, you, so yeah, so they've got a sibling rivalry, and um, which dates from before uh, Dream was trapped. And uh, so pre, like the, the Dream that didn't think he could change was the one who's having the fight with with Desire. Yes, and it's the Dream that that is that has learned to change that is that that confronts them about that about what they tried to do uh because there's a there's another element here of like it's hinted that um that if dream killed rose because she's a vortex and could like bring down the 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 world that he'd also be killing a family member which for the endless apparently is a really big deal um uh which so i think that that was a that was interestingly how that was hinted um but uh, where I'm kind of going with this, kind of going back again, back to this whole like, arconic thing about like um, there being spiritual powers that are um, that are controlling us or are trying to keep us down, et cetera, et cetera. Where I'm kind of going with this is like um, one of the things that I've heard uh, some really good folks talk about in, in terms of Gnosticism, specifically in terms of like the Demiurge and um, the Archons, et cetera, is that it's not that it's, all in your head, but that the 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 limiting forces, the things that, that do get in the way of us having the, these connections with the divine, are often things that we are engaged in ourselves. Like that, like so, you know, like time isn't the archon. The archon is that feeling you have that you're late for work and need to rush. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, um, it's not that like you know there's, there, it's not this divine person who's like take in charge of making sure you're late for things it's the system that like i say like a, a highly capitalist system that says you need to be at certain places at certain times in certain ways that this is how this works and and that kind of that stress is part of something that keeps you from like being chill enough to feel gnosis occasionally <laughs> as an yeah. this is a really reductive example but like um, I think there's something interesting here about, and going back to your thought about uh, about um, gods being written about by humans writing about gods, like this kind of recursive element here of like, it's recognizing, and going back, again back to the notion that they are in service of us, it's recognizing that we, 
uh, we can both limit ourselves and free ourselves, if that mm. makes sense, mm -hmm. uh, which is like there's sort of a, um, a, lib a, a both a liberatory and um, confining aspect to that. Um, and I think maybe something interesting is that dream real begins to realize that he can change. But I don't know if desire knows that, mm, mm -hmm. you know, like I think desire, all desire knows is like how to revel in these feelings and, um, and that there's like, and that there's only one way to do it. And that's how they're doing it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just think there's something, um, uh, really interesting there about this sort of liberatory element of like of the the gods changing as we change our ability to see ourselves culturally you know what i mean like if you, if you really just kind of like run wild with this it's it's like um that uh the idea of the um the collective unconscious the like the you know the the sort of dreamscape uh imaginarium that that the gods live in you know um somewhere on the I don't know where it would be on the uh, uh, the capitalistic tree of life. There's like sort of a layer of like where you could say that these ideas are living at um, that 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 layer doesn't enforce down on us. It is imprinted on by us upwards, if that makes sense. Huh, and so, yeah. like as culture changes, then that th then then those imprints start to change. And if we can, and I think like. Arguably, even because I think it's maybe even worth noting, Neil Gaiman is um, a pretty politically engaged individual, a pretty like um, uh, like engaged in popular culture, but definitely not um, controlled by it, um, and like has a whole lot of um, like punches back against, say, folks who are complaining that an actor was cast with a different ethnicity or gender than what mm. was in the comics, that kind of thing. Um, that like. That yeah, so like Neil Gaiman by trying to create both in the comics and then now with the show, things that have these like these liberatory elements, these mysterious elements that he's like trying to 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 like add to that imprint of culture in ways that are more positive that do lead like to more, you know, like the, to dream. Uh, going even back to the maiden mother crone, like maybe there wasn't a historical basis the way Robert Graves might have claimed. But enough works like Sandman help create space for that in the in the dreamscape, if that makes mm, sense. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm really rambling. I don't know if that's... <laughs> no, all of these words are delicious and delightful. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm here for this. I think the idea of us imprinting up, yeah, because going back to my hot take that God is a construct, mm -hmm. uh, why did we create gods? Why did we create those characters through which again to see ourselves mm -hmm. and and also try and explain something that is larger than us and where we are positionally like what's our positionality like in the world what you know and and our levels of interaction mm -hmm. but the you know the earliest gods were to explain weather phenomenons and um, yeah. the sun as a god because it's what we see in the sky every day and the moon as another god because that's what comes out later so kind of going even back to like why have we created these cultural imprints in the dreamscape and so as we change then our imprints also have to change that's very um god is dead <laughs> um, like philosophically yeah. of me to be like you know yeah. god god has died and so now we need new gods but i do think that there's something in the witnessing of a god or someone mm -hmm. like dream the endless change that makes it more accessible to us that we're like okay if that person can change you know then yeah. we can change as well um and the really interesting thing is it does come with its own kind of humility so what you were saying about desire only reveling in the feeling of it and that kind of being its own trapping mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't allow for desire to step outside of that and see mm -hmm. other plays or other options um dream has to give up some sense of power or control in order to enact change in his own realm, he has to mm -hmm. apologize to mm -hmm. the people that have been working for him or are underneath him. Like he has a librarian character, <laughs> you know, yeah. 
Lucius, who is really fascinating to watch their relationship because um, Lucius really wants to, or Lucien, am I? Lucien, I think Lucien, you're right. Lucien, yeah. okay. Yeah. Really wants to um, kind of go to bat for him with other characters, or at least say, think highly of him, um, where other characters might want to say that he had been abandoned, he had abandoned them, he'd allowed himself mm. to get captured. Again, embarrassing. And uh, <laughs> I do love that, like, it's humiliating what happened to him. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but, but he has to apologize to Lucien for not seeing when he came back, you know, his, the effects um, and for not taking her advice at one point, not mm -hmm. um, kind of being open to that. And then the main character, like the, the real change at the end is with one of the nightmare creations, mm -hmm. Gold. So he has reclaimed, like the Corinthian, you know, all of these nightmares while he'd been captured, they'd escaped into the waking world or were mm. running amok in the dream space and had too much power. So he has to like reel them back in. But one of them says, I've changed. Like my time spent without you or with the humans, like I no longer want to be a nightmare. I actually want to be a good dream. I want to be yeah. a, a good a good force of, of creativity and like joy. And so, mm -hmm. At the end, he retools her. He recreates her to be a good dream and like allows her to fly off. And that was like a huge, um, a huge act of change in humility, kind of in dream to even allow, allow for the idea that um, not only he could change, but then his past creations, like he could help them live a different life. Mm -hmm. as well I think was interesting in a way that desire you're right like that's not accessible to desire right now and we see that actually in their control over their twin despair yeah which that was the only casting that I was like oh I don't know <laughs> uh, Neil Gaiman and I can talk about that on Tumblr <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah you know it's uh that is well yeah I'd be fascinated to 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 see that exchange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I just I'll, I guess I'll say why. Yeah. Um, despair is like this very um, is is like a fat woman, and I just hated mm -hmm. that casting. That mm -hmm. I felt like it was the only part of the show that the casting was very deliberately kind of fat phobic. Like that, this mm -hmm. must be despair. You must. Feel miserable about yourself and I felt like that yeah. was the only casting everything else was pretty ingenious I thought mm -hmm. um but yeah, yeah that was the only one that kind of rubbed me the wrong way yeah I know it's like well and so uh interestingly like my first response is is like that it's actually worse in the comics <laughs> um you know like that they're actually that's one of the castings that felt like they were definitely trying to to, to remind you as much as possible of the comics um although in the, like in the comics she's nude um mm. and so there's like a lot it's a it's even a more fraught image it was also like created about 20 some years ago so there's something cultural context there i don't know yeah it's interesting uh of course yeah oh yeah. you know one thing we actually haven't talked about as well just in terms of casting is like lucifer um oh yes gwendolyn uh, christie my beloved yeah <laughs> gwendolyn christie as lucifer is amazing um, but also as a fan, so different from the comics. Like in the comics, Lucifer is depicted mostly like David Bowie. <laughs> okay. um, uh, like generally masculine with an element of androgyny, but like, um, although uh, when people were upset about Gwendolyn Christie's casting on Twitter and Tumblr and stuff, I think Neil Gaiman's response was like, um, well, considering that it was a character without a penis, I thought casting an actor without a penis was still appropriate. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought, which, you know, I'm like, the, thank you for, thank you for punching back, uh, Mr. Gaiman. But, um, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah, well, and even, even, um, Lucifer's perception of themselves, uh, and, like, what they have to be versus what they want to be, like, and the nature of change, like, I think that's actually really interesting, um, mm -hmm. uh, as well. 
Sorry, I feel like I jumped into a whole different direction there. No, I mean, you kind of you kind of did just looking at yeah. the time. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> we can go here. Um, no, but I think I, I'm so glad that you brought up Lucifer and especially in this notion of change, but also in this idea that um, the characters in the world of Sandman that we are supposed to assume or that we would assume have kind of ultimate dominion mm -hmm. actually don't. Um, mm -hmm. And Lucifer is another example of that, like supposed to be the god of hell, essentially like the ruler of hell. But at the very mm -hmm. end, she finds out that all of the underlings are upset that uh, ab about what happened with Dream. They dueled mm -hmm. and Dream won and um, upset about this and basically are going to force Lucifer into waging war. And so we would think like, oh, Lucifer would be in a position to shut that whole thing down. But in fact, where they leave us at the end of season one, it looks pretty probable that they're going to go to war or that some, you know, some action will be wait. taken. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for season two. Like it's going to be, um, like I kind of know what's coming. Um, I, I hope they go the direction of the comics, if only because I will be super impressed. Like if it's not, uh, I won't say anymore. I won't say okay, anymore, cool. <laughs> but it's so cool. And it, it connects to this notion of change of like what, what even things we think have absolute dominion can change if, if they can change. Um, uh, there was something else you said about, um, about Lucifer. Oh, shoot. Um, oh, no, and maybe, yeah, so there's something maybe to mention. I would say it's more in the first half of the season than in the second half, and this actually kind of tracks again to the comics, but the first half of the season lives in kind of a horror movie vibe. Like, there's a lot of horror elements, I would mm -hmm. say, to them. Um, things that are, like, kind of gruesome or intense, like um, uh, when when Dream is getting his sand back, he realizes that the, that a human woman has found the sand and basically become addicted to it um, and is like, you know, lying in bed, just kept alive by dreaming, you know, which is kind of intense. Um, and then uh, uh, the the thing with the, um, oh yeah, the mask he goes to hell for, and that's yeah. that has horror elements to it just because he's going through hell. Um, uh, there's an interesting moment, again, in terms of, like, things they don't explain, where, like, he walks past a, a cell and a meets woman. a young yeah. woman, yeah, who says that they are that they were lovers, and in the moment, as he passes by, uh, so I can't remember the actor's name who plays, who plays Sandman, I should have checked oh, this out. Oh, Tom back. Sturridge. Tom Sturridge. In that moment when, when uh, Dream is walking by, he's not played by Tom Sturridge, he's played by a Black actor. Yeah. Uh, because the woman in the cage is black, which also connects to this idea that the that the that endless are reflections of those that are engaged with them, mm. um, which also connects to the dream of a thousand cats. We can't we haven't even talked about that. I know <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that like you know you meet uh, without giving away too much. I think I kind of said that it's like about humans dreaming a different world that, would, that creates the world we're living in. Um, oh man, okay. All right. Okay, let me see if I can wrangle these thoughts together. First thing is that, uh, just to connect back to the dream changing themselves, is um, dream is a cat in the dream of a thousand cats. You meet okay. dream as a cat, <laughs> um, which is amazing all, all by itself. But there is, like, going back to this notion of change and that notion, this notion of, like, us imprinting upwards, that's kind of the premise of dream of a thousand cats, is that the humans... Are living in a world that cats control. The cats are huge. The cats are big as houses, and humans are these little like servants of them and playthings of them. And uh, and then like uh, they, they like a human gets an idea and says, if we dream of a world where that that is different from this one, we'll get that. And it says that yeah, basically things change because a thousand humans dream something different. Mm. Um, uh, and that not only is it like that that it's not that the world w was one thing and became another thing it's that that dream literally made it a different world in which the humans have always been in control um huh. so there's a sense of like yeah like maybe we need to start thinking about what dreams we're putting into the air you know 
um, again, in that liberatory element, like how maybe yes. we dream. And it, it's also kind of why I do push against versions of Gnosticism that are only focused on on archons, on conspiracies, on like the um, uh, just how, like, you know, how the world is is terrible and it's the demiurge keeping you down because it never makes space for a good dream. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A good, like a, a sense of like what we're trying to reach beyond that. Um, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I went on a whole tangent there. No, it's a, so great. Yeah. I think there's actually so much um, social justice and uh, that like uh, using that umbrella, there's so much theory mm -hmm. and there's so, um, so much written about the way to the way to a different world is through an imaginative dream space that we need mm. to be able to imagine it first in order to then close the gap between uh, what we have now, like what is reality reflecting now mm -hmm. and what would we like it to reflect. So I, I think there's a, a lot of, of legitimate political theory that would support that would support that claim of dreaming as a way to progress. Oh, completely. Like, in fact, I think I, I think it's true that uh, seatbelts got easier to normalize when, like, Hollywood started having people put on their seatbelts every time they got in the car. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, yeah, you know, uh, and that I, I've, I've even heard some of them talk about, like, an idea around climate change, that if we started representing people just behaving more more uh, climate conscious in our in our popular fiction without the fiction being about that just as an element inside it mm. that it will normalize the conversation you know um uh but so representation think, yeah, matters like it literally does it literally <laughs> does no i said that very <laughs> flippantly but i do believe that yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too me too yes. um uh yeah I, maybe like I, I'll, I'll maybe throw out a few last crumbs that are in my head here is that like yeah, I have that uh, so, Oh, great, great. Um, uh, there's a there's a a, a thought that um, that often sometimes comes up when you discuss these ideas of like the archons as you know um, you feeling stressed about your time that kind of thing is that um, uh, people are like oh you're just you're just making it all psychology this is just you're just psychologizing it and I think um, I'm not but what I think I am trying to do is I'm trying to engage as a modern person in the in the world. Um, with a way of engaging with the forces that are that are interacting with me um, that doesn't require uh, for me like a, a much sort of bigger step uh, and, and and also kind of maybe can let in some narratives that I'm not comfortable with like mm -hmm. that can lead to, to ideas of like time as a literal policeman that's like trying to make my life suck if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually maybe kind of a dangerous image because then it lets me blame the God for that and not, you know, not engage with my own choices. Mm. Um, but all of this is also, the reason, I, the reason I'm going here is because a quote I always keep bringing up on this subject is that um, uh, I think the occultist uh, Lon Milo Duquette said once, he goes, yes, of course it's all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. And I love that, and I think anybody who hears that and thinks that it's just equating psychology to esotericism, etc., hasn't really listened to the quote. <laughs> like, you have no idea how big your head is. It's so much bigger than anything you're thinking right now. Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. What is um, that artwork that's um, like the layers and somebody peeking behind? Oh, uh, you mean Terrible. like the, that sort of classic, the classic yeah. Gnostic image kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, a guy yeah. kind of pushing his way through, yeah. Yeah, but um, the whole thing is his head on both yeah. sides. Yeah. And so it's not yeah. just like what he's seeing. Yeah, that's what that made me think of. I mean, like there's a part of heck even to, 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 to tie right back into Gnosticism. If like we're all connected to the divine spark, then we are all a piece of the divine experiencing itself. So it is all one big head anyway. <laughs> it know. is, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so yeah, that was just kind of a last piece I wanted to throw there, and also maybe to say that, um, to like a little bit of advocacy here is that, like, yeah, if you are thinking as a Gnostic, as a, as a, as an esotericist, um, you know, like think about the idea that that some of these forces, particularly the ones maybe that are more negative, that they can change, and you, you can be part of changing them. Yeah, yeah.
Well, and also I thought you brought up a really good point about it all being in your head. Um, one of my kind of uh, like the something stuck in my teeth about Gnosticism is kind of, and a lot of religions do this and a lot mm. of philosophies do this is kind of damn the body and say, oh, it's a flesh <laughs> prison or here, <laughs> like, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and so I think what we've been talking about, there is a feeling portion of Gnosis that is really easy to intellectualize. But if you don't, if you don't, then it is a feeling. It exists in the body. I'm even kind of like shaking my shoulders a little bit just <laughs> talking about it. And feelings, to my knowledge, are fleeting physical experiences. So not only is our human form, like we are not the body, but we are also not not the body. So yeah. To demonize it will always kind of separate you from it in a way that might also not be the healthiest of choices. Like mm -hmm. you'll inherently be working with a dissociated sense of self. Mm -hmm. And um, and then also, you know, this is how we experience this world as well. So if we're talking about not intellectualizing philosophy, like it needs to become an embodied, integrated thing. So how you are viewing some of these more esoteric concepts is also how you're going to be entering the world. So I think going back to that like serial killer convention, mm -hmm. a lot of what um, what Dream I felt was saying to them was like, you've let somebody tell you you're doing good things and you are not. <laughs> like you are not mm -hmm. doing good things and you are yeah. creating harm. And then you see all of those people walk away some feel remorse, some have to, trigger warning, kill themselves because they can't live with what they have done. It's like he really did kind of pull back the curtain and mm -hmm. behind these narratives that you're telling yourself, like, can you actually stand behind what you've done? Like how you've embodied your own philosophy, essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's huge. Yeah. That is huge. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, are you? Yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Well, no, no, you go. <laughs> No, finish your thought, because I think you were going somewhere interesting. Oh, well, I was just going to say, you know, it's great to wax poetic about all of these things, but then you have to be with the kind of person that you are in the world, because we can also tell stories all day, but we only have this. We only have what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like, how are you embodying your own philosophies? That's that's great. I've got I've got more thoughts on that, but I feel like that's such a good ending line. I don't want to... <laughs> you don't want to go there. I can. I can we'll come back. <laughs> um, uh, maybe the, the 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 glib version of like of it is that I think um, world hating Gnosticism started because somebody was like hungry and it distracted them from trying to focus on gnosis, and then they're like, "Damn this body." <laughs> yes, there are many reasons to not be satisfied with the physical form as it exists uh, as an animal. <laughs> there are plenty of reasons. That That is something that I think is interesting of how, you know, we've seen evolution at work and yet mm -hmm. these bodies are still just so funky and, um, and in some ways like such a mystery to us still, even though mm -hmm. they are quite literally all we know. Um, yeah, we're let's focus on everything else because this thing is too confusing. <laughs> right, like pass, <laughs> pass on yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I think I, I just want to go back to your your sentence there because I think it's really valuable. Like uh, as you as you're engaging with a lot of these kinds of philosophies and ideas, what what kind? How are you embodying them, and how are you living living in them through the world? Because that's at the end of the day, what is going to be true no matter what. You know, mm -hmm. is that this the, this is the things you did, you know, as you move through the world. Um, I think that's that's really important. And I think what uh, uh, what Sandman is doing is it's using these mythological and horror themes and um, uh, um, family dynamics and cosmic ideas as um, because these are literally embodied elements of forces mm -hmm. <laughs> to really kind of go. What is it to live through these ideas? What happens if these ideas are taken as far as they can go? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Is there anything anything else on the table that you still any crumbs you want to put out there? Oh, 
Yeah, kind of. I just found it so interesting how many sibling stories were in Sandman, mm -hmm. which I thought was an interesting through line. And I'm an only child, so I mainly too. just have more. Oh, man. All right. We got to get someone <laughs> with siblings in here. Well, I guess it just left me with more, <laughs> more questions. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to. So the first siblings that we see are actually once dream. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to take it back. The magician that captures um, dream, uh, dream has a son that's living and also a son that has died. And so his initial reasoning for capturing dream is to bargain with death through dream uh, in order to get his son back, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then dream is unwilling to work with him. And um, so there is this sibling relationship between the living son and the dead son that the living son cannot get out of this relationship, like the sibling relationship, because mm -hmm. the, the dead son has been idolized um, and idealized in the mind of the father. And now the living son is a disappointment and, and so on and so forth. So that was the first one. Then um, when Dream returns to the dreamscape, like his realms, we see Cain and Abel. And Cain mm -hmm. and Abel are repeatedly going through the experience of um, he kills, you know, Cain kills Abel, right? I think mm -hmm. that's the right way. Um, and buries yeah. him. And then he is like reborn kind of every day. And so we have this, we have the literal first siblings in, in some mythologies and the first murderer, which I also thought was really interesting Yeah. Um, in their existence. But again, they're only in one episode. They don't really, mm -hmm. things we don't explain. Um, and then obviously Dream has his siblings. And then also in the Rose story, Rose is trying to get to be reconnected with her brother who there had, they had been separated. So mm -hmm. there is this recurring theme of siblings and and separated siblings kind of being reconnected or or still that relationship still working even if they're not all living or together. Yeah. Well there's something really interesting there. I mean there's probably somebody who would know a little bit more say like about uh like attachment theories and like you know some of the <laughs> yeah. psychologies that happen around families um that have siblings because i think yeah it is i think like just even just thinking it through a little is that if if your if your sort of developmental experience is not just between a parent and a child or like as a child to a parent but a, but as a child to a parent with another child who has similar but not identical desires you know like food and comfort and etc yeah. um and a different relationship to that to that figure and like it's part of it's part of what you know as your life so there's like an element of conflict or at least like tension there i think that's yeah there's something really interesting there about what that is to um tension but also love mm -hmm. you know like that there is a relate like with cain and abel it's interesting that it's like uh, Cain keeps killing Abel, but you get the impression that they do still care about each other. Totally. It's part of their yeah. normal routine. Like when yeah. Abel comes back and like literally comes out of the ground, um, yeah. something happens and he's like, oh, I don't think anything has happened that will make him kill me yet. Like, I think we're still chill for today. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just part of their normal um, day to day. Yeah. And, they, and they do have this otherworldly acknowledgement of who they are in story that I think the dream characters have. Mm. Oh, we forgot about a change. Um, well, the Corinthian changes form, uh, also unexplained, because the Corinthian is, um, for Doctor Who fans, Jenna Coleman, um, in like the past, and then in the present is the guy with teeth eyes, with right. teeth for eyes, um, which they don't explain how she is the Corinthian and how oh uh, are you talking about the one that's in the in the bar yes she, but she also shows up a few times like kind of throughout mm. time I'm, am i getting I'm, that I'm wrong forgetting. well so the, there is a character in the in the, the 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 bar story where they go they meet at the same bar every year or every hundred years um uh where she's actually connected to the um, she's the one who helps Dream find her, uh, find his sand. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
so that's not uh, the Corinthian. It's Constantine. Um, is her oh, name? Oh, I am wrong. Then. Constant okay. So then you can either edit that out, or you can let the people know that I am human and <laughs> and everybody well, makes mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you know, just, just blame an archon. That's that's my take on an it. An archon made me do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An archon, oh, an archon made me do it. Oh my gosh! Here we go. There's a merch, merch idea. Is happening. It's happening. Um, um, yeah, that was my only thought. Was like the siblings, the the siblings of mm -hmm. it all. Yes, I think that's no really answers, interesting. just questions. Yeah, well, and I think there, like, there is in a lot of Gnostic cosmology, like there are, there is a, this idea, like Sophia is both like a mother and like a, a re relation to a lot of the demiurges mm -hmm. and archons, even though she's kind of also a path to gnosis and like. Yeah, so family dynamics. I mean, like, try to find me a mythology that doesn't have family dynamics in it. Like, True. it again, it's that thing of like echoing, you know, imprinting upwards. You know, like we yes. live in a world of family dynamics, and so we we engage with a world in family dynamics. Like, um, uh, and you know, so one thing that I think is also just a quick thing here about Cain and Abel and Joanna Constantine is that. Um, what the show avoids or it doesn't engage with as much is that the comic existed when it was published within the DC universe. So this is the universe of Batman and Superman and and uh, and all of that. Um, like Batman shows up in one story very briefly. Like um, and characters like um, uh, Joanna Constantine are based on another character invented by Alan Moore called John Con John Constantine. Um, for uh, the Swamp Thing comics, um, without going deep into that, because that's a whole other show, but um, uh, Cain and Abel also existed in the DC comics as hosts, kind of like Tales from the Crypt Keeper okay. of, of, of a series of comics called, I think, Tales of Mystery and I think Tales of Murder or something like that. Huh. And that they would be in these houses and they would kind of like welcome you in. Do you want a tale of murder or do you want a tale of mystery? Like, you know. Um, Oh, that's and cool. So, okay, so this is full circle back to your, like, there's reward for people who are familiar. Like, they're mm -hmm. like Easter eggs almost in this larger thing, but that yeah. it wouldn't, unless you're me and you just think everyone's the Corinthian, um, it wouldn't <laughs> bother you. <laughs> no, it wouldn't hey, bother you to not know. <laughs> no. Well, and I, like, uh, I, it led to a, a good moment of just kind of engaging with, with where that, um, uh, where that concept comes from. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and where those characters come from. And I think like, it is interesting how the show doesn't, doesn't not use those characters, but also doesn't uh, worry about using them the way they were used in the comics as related to their greater DC comics lives. You sure. know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think that's, that, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, uh, which again, maybe, maybe goes back to this idea of like mythology being, a, you know, not about what was true, you know, yeah. like in terms of how it was published before, you know, um, uh, yeah. Um, and maybe again, this notion of true versus useful, like there's a, um, because fans will complain like, oh, this character was a different race or a different gender or what have you. Um, but I think like without being reductive, there's a part of me that wants to go like the character that you're referring to as the original is still fictional. Like, you know, 100%. Like, <laughs> the, the, like, no, the number of hours that we all as human beings spend arguing about things that we made up is like baffling to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it goes <laughs> it goes back to the, the my thing about being it being true or useful is like um does does the is it more useful for dream say to be played by a different ethnicity, you know? I I would argue yes. It's it's more interesting, it's more relevant to today um, than, uh, you know, like it's, it's a choice and it's also Neil Gaiman adapting it. So like, it's not like someone else is doing this at, you know, like say producer's behest or something like that. This is the creator of the comic deciding right. as a creator of the show or an executive producer or whatever, you know, this is a change that is, you know, that we're like, uh, we're making and that like, kind of again, going back to this notion of like, um, mythological truths, religious truths that, uh, it like, is it useful and resonant today, you know, mm -hmm. um, versus, uh, needing it, needing it to have been accurate to an original text or a previous text. I do want to maybe like one quick 
side thing there. I know we keep finding more things to talk about, but I'll I'll, I'll try to wrap it up after this. Is that um, I, I keep saying true versus or useful versus true. One thing I do want to maybe really be clear about is that the criteria for it being useful isn't just whether or not uh, I like it or my friends like it or what have you. Like there is a level of um, like aesthetic rigor that I think mm. has to be applied. Like, um, you know, does it stand up to more than just like what makes me maybe feel powerful or, or you know, justified or what have you? Like, does it open itself up to mystery? Does it challenge me? Like things like that. Um, uh, and I think that like, I think a lot of um, uh, aesthetic criticism, like uh, literary criticism, you know, art criticism is a great way of engaging with spiritual criticism because these are, they're not like, no one can tell you that, that um, this, you know, say novel is wrong, mm -hmm. but they can defend their position about why it's not useful, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, like, the, like my issue with the casting of Despair, yeah. to me, that's not a useful picture anymore because mm -hmm. it is now working to uh, support a narrative or a worldview that I no longer think is useful, true, or working. Mm -hmm. So to me, mm -hmm. that casting choice is not useful. And exactly. also, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go in also because that's going to oh. going to take us down a hole. I could be here for hours, <laughs> just well, like I'm... Sandman folding in on myself. <laughs> um, well, yeah, maybe maybe we'll leave it there for now. But yeah. if we if we're both like, hey, we've actually got like 12 more things we should talk about. You know, it's like a uh, it's what eight you no know, 11 episodes on Netflix. There's you know. Uh, we've only spent uh, an hour and 30 talking about it so far. There's more to talk about. Um, and also, if anyone's listening to this and is like, must have more Sandman content, then let us know. Because if we're just, we can just talk too. to ourselves. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. if you're yeah, clamoring totally. for more conversation about the Sandman, let us yeah. know. If you disagree, like actually, I would love to do another follow-up show where, where we respond to people disagreeing with like some of our takes. <laughs> Not the hot ones, though. Just kidding. <laughs> you can, you can, especially the hot ones. Especially the hot ones, yeah. yeah. Um, great. Okay, well, uh, yeah, so I'm going to do some of the wrap-up stuff here. Um, uh, do you want to say the name of your website while I put it up on the screen? Yeah, sure. Um, you can find me at rebeccaskolnick.com. Here's the spelling for you right there. Um, and that's kind of the gateway into most of my work. You can find me on social media through my website. You can also um, find more uh, podcasts that I've been a part of, some that I've hosted and created, some that I've just been a guest on, um, as well as my book, which is called The Witch's Book of Numbers. And we have a direct link to it right there. Um, but when you're on my site, I've made it very easy for you. It just says, buy my book. So <laughs> you can just click on that. Um, is, yeah, uh, is there like a short, like, um, you know, bite-size uh, uh, sales pitch for the book? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the Witch's <laughs> Book of Numbers meets you in the intersection of witchcraft and numerology, which is a tool that looks at the divine language or the divinity of numbers. And so mm. the book is... For anybody, I really have tried to put something in there for everyone, whether you are like super witchy, want to work with pagan sabbats and um, have ritual witchcraft, or if you're just a history nerd or um, like a story buff, there's myth, there's legend, there's the history of, of kind of numerology and the study of numbers. But yeah, there's a little something in there for everyone. So it's just about numbers and how to add that to your life. Amazing. Um, so yeah, and I'm uh, Jason Memel. Uh, you can find me at jasonmemel.com. Um, pretty easy to find there. Um, I do, if you happen to be in Calgary, um, uh, then you can come to productions that I put on through Sage Theatre, and that's sagetheatre.com. Um, if you're not in Calgary, well, uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and maybe the other thing too is just, uh, yeah, let us know about, the about anything you had a question about about the show and or uh, thoughts or disagreements or hot takes or things you agree with, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to more Popnosis soon. I, I think that's it. Uh, let's, yeah. uh, I'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.